Amen. All right. So turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. I missed something. <laughs> Sunday school. Sunday school. Uh, we were in First Timothy. Oh, this is in First Timothy. Yeah. I was going to say somebody slipped him my notes, didn't they? <laughs> so we'll, get, we'll get to where you are now one of these days. Second Timothy chapter 4. Amen. After just a brief recap in discipleship, I think we went through two or three actual verses. So, But that's all right. Uh, I believe in digging, folks. <clears throat> that's, that's how we learn. Dig in there. It pays off. Yes. In good dividends. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, as you're turning, uh, as always, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, and just know that you've already been blessed just for coming to the house of the Lord. Uh, but there's more blessings in store. Amen? Thank you. All right. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is uh, Paul writing to Timothy. And I understand he's writing this to Timothy as giving some instruction to the preacher. But guess what? How many of us in here are Christians understand that we're all called to the Great Commission? Amen. We're all called yes. to share the gospel. So what is a preacher? Huh? A, a, a preacher is, if you get into the definitions of the Greek, they're a herald. They, they share the word. They spread the word. Okay? As Christians doing the Great Commission, we're all supposed to share the word. Yes, the the pastor he gets into some other categories and and different job descriptions, but we as Christians are all supposed to be sharing the gospel, the Great Commission. So we can look at what Paul wrote to Timothy in regards to preaching, and we can bring that to ourselves and say, "Well, I'm supposed to be doing something very similar as a Christian out here sharing the word." Amen? Amen. Raise your hand if you're a Christian and God calls you to park it on the bench and never never do anything, never talk about Jesus, never share the Word. Brother Tim, that close. He, he, he was rubbing his head. I was like... I was fixing to have some fun with him. Amen. Appreciate Brother Tim. I can always laugh with him and it's okay. All right. Yes, it is. All right. So, uh, we need to understand a few things about the life of Paul when we get into this. Did Paul have, you know, he was a great man. Blessed man of God, right? Was it always, you know, strawberries and peaches and all that good stuff? Right. Uh, nowadays, we would call him a terrorist. Okay. But after he become a Christian, he become a great example to us. Uh, of in Paul's life, whenever things got hard, he didn't give up. Okay, he kept going. We have a saying around here, I don't know if this is just a southern, a southern thing or not, but we say you keep on keeping on. Yes. Well, what do you do when it gets, things get hard? You just keep on keeping on. Okay? That's what we're going to do. That's what we got to do. I believe he wrote about 14 books of the, the yes. New Testament. That's one over half. He, he, he wrote the majority of the New yes. Testament Amen. at that point. What would so. do? Yes, very thankful for the Apostle Paul. Yeah. So when, when Satan, when things get hard in our life and when Satan's tempting us, don't give up. Amen. So I, I know those of us that have ever been deer hunting or something like that, we know exactly what I'm fixing to say. But if you've ever been out in the woods 
just before daylight, there's, there's something that happens. So if you get out there, say, two hours before daylight, you know, just before it gets daylight, it gets darker. Just before the sun comes up, it gets even darker than it was 30 minutes ago. And to the mind, that's like, that's weird because it's fixing to get light. Why is it getting darker? And in my experience with dealing with some people and talking with some people, it seems like when that darkest time comes, just before the light, that's when some people finally just give up. That's not the time to give up. Don't, don't pray and seek God and get right up to the point that God's fixing to answer prayer and He's ready to move. And we're throwing the towel and say, I just can't do it no more, I give up. Even Jesus, in His flesh, right? He prayed to God the Father and He said, If it be Thy will, let this cup pass from Me. Amen. In other words, Father, I know what's coming and I'm not looking forward to it. My body don't want to feel this pain. But you know what? If it's your will, Father, I'll do it anyway. Yeah. Amen. How many of us as Christians has got our heart fixed with the Lord to the point that regardless of what we think and what we feel, we're going to go with God regardless. That's the way we got to be. We must, we must. Yes, we must be to that point. Because you, you start looking around the world at what's going on and there's opportunities, there's things coming against Christians Every day, trying to turn us away from the gospel. Trying to turn us from Jesus. It's happening. Amen. So, you know, if we're going to be Christians, we're going to have to be Christians. Not just in title only, not just in the name tag, but it's got to be who we are. Okay? So let's look at this. Um, John, or not John... 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul's talking to Timothy. He said, I charge thee therefore before God. So he's not just saying, you know, if you want to, I'll make it easy. It's up to you. No, he, he's putting this on the line. He's saying, I'm, I charge you before God. There, he's placing responsibility. Yeah. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. At the appearing in His kingdom. Okay, that's a promise. That's going to happen. Okay? Yes, it will. It says, preach the word. Okay, herald, proclaim it. Share the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. So be prepared. Be prepared for what? Good times, bad times? Be prepared to give the word. Be prepared to have an answer. Okay? Okay? It says to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. All right, let's look at this. Preach the word, share the word, okay? Be instant or be ready, be prepared. In season, out of season. What do you mean in season and out of season? At all times. Yes. Not when it's convenient. But you should be prepared and ready to give the gospel, give the word of the Lord when it's not convenient. Yes. If, some, if we're in a room full of people and one person is expressing the desire to know more about Jesus and the other 99 people in the room hates Jesus, you've got to be prepared to talk to that one person. Oh, but the 99 will be against me. Well, what if the 99 who don't like Jesus hears you telling about Jesus to the one that's interested, and then the 99 gets interested? And by being obedient to the Word and sharing the Gospel with the one, when it's not convenient, when everybody else is against you, you may help lead the whole room of a hundred to Jesus. Because you were ready and you were prepared with the Word, with the Gospel, even whenever the things that you're facing is not convenient to share the Gospel. Yes, amen. Now this is where uh, some things gets a little different. It says to reprove. That means to correct. Okay, rebuke. That means to forbid. Exhort. Well, that means to encourage. Okay, 
with all long suffering. A lot of Christians, they want to leave that part out. Uh, with all long suffering, that means patience. Uh, and doctrine. Doctrine is the instruction or the teachings. Too many Christians, they want to help you, they want to teach you uh, without the patience. You just need to do what I say and do it right now. You need to change your life right now. Okay, uh, What you're doing is wrong. It's sin. So I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to correct you and tell you to stop doing it. And you do it right now. And then they walk out of the church and you never see them again. There's a right and a wrong way to do things. Yes. And the right way is God's way. Yes, we're not the judge and we're not the jury. Okay? There is a right way to tell somebody their life is wrong. Uh, there is a right way to reprove and rebuke. Yes. It's easy to exhort. It's easy to encourage somebody. Yeah. But the challenge comes in to repu reproving and rebuking in love. Because as soon as we turn that dial down on love... At the same time, that turns the dial up on the flesh. That wants to turn the attitude on. Well, we can't have one. Okay? I, I know there's something to be said, and y'all bear with me. There's something to be said about churches who refuse to preach against sin, who refuse... <laughs> Too many of these words. Who refuse to preach against sin who refuses uh, to preach sound doctrine. Okay, that's good, truthful doctrine. Um, but instead they compromise and they want to they love everybody to the point that they compromise the church, they compromise their beliefs and say, just come as you are. And I think that's a saying that we've kind of messed up over time. If the world, if the lost person's coming in, they're coming in as a lost person. They're coming in as a sinner. They're coming in as they are. We can't expect them to come in looking and acting like a Christian when they're not. So Christians cannot place that false expectation on somebody coming in the church that's never heard of Jesus or doesn't know how to live a Christian life because they don't. Okay? Uh, but over time, people have got into this rut and they turn people away from Christ instead of allow the Lord to draw them in. Okay? So there is a right and a wrong way to reprove and rebuke. Alright, that was free. Um, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay? Yes. And, and that sound doctrine, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that's that, that true, that pure. Yes, amen. I want to add this word, uncorrupt. You want to get doctrines, that's the teachings and the, the instruction. You want to get that messed up and get it corrupted, you let man put his input into it. And it gets messed up. That's why we no longer have one gospel. We have 1,500 different versions of it. That's in man. There's still only one gospel. Okay? Yes. For the time will come, this is a promise, and I believe that promise has been fulfilled as we speak. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Oh, well, if it's offensive, I don't want to preach it because it might hurt somebody's feelings. If that's the way that we preach, the churches would be packed. You, uh, are you a liar? Well, I won't preach against lying, even though the Word of God says in its abomination. It's, it's one of the sins that God specifies. He says, I hate. He said, all sinners or all liars will have their place in hell, in that flame, in the fire. All sinners. I won't preach that if it hurts your feelings. Uh, if you're living in an adulterous situation, I won't preach against that if you find it offensive. Huh? There's churches that do that. Okay, that's, that's what it's talking about. 
people is going to go expecting somebody to pat them on the back and pat them on the diaper and not preach against sin and tell them that everything is all right. Because that's what they want to hear. Well, they need to hear the truth of the gospel because that is what changes lives. Okay, not, uh, not a preacher who's afraid to confront sin and preach against it. Some things will stick with me, I pray, to the day I die. But I can't tell you how many times I grew up listening to Brother Ted preach and say that too many preachers was standing behind the door. Okay, you know what that means. They had the door open, they was back behind it. They were behind the door whenever God passed out the guts and the backbone. Huh? I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I love everybody. God loves everybody, but He don't love the sin. Amen. The sin is not acceptable. No sin shall enter into those gates. And any preacher that compromises that and says it's okay is a liar and a devil. You just called a preacher a devil. No, I didn't. I called somebody filling the office of a preacher a devil who's been a liar and a deceiver. That was free too, because that wasn't part of the lesson. All right. Uh, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, shall be turned unto myths. Okay, they're turning the truth into things that's not true. They're turning the truth into made-up stories. I've heard that plenty over the years. The Bible is just a group of, uh, a collection of made-up stories. I've heard it. It's not made-up stories. It's a collection of real-life events that took place. Amen. Okay? Yes, Archaeology has proven countless times the, the historical value and the relevance of the Bible. Whenever a man's, doc, a man's documentation couldn't find something, they actually used the Bible as a reference source to find the things they were looking for. Well, if it's made up stories, it sure has got a lot of truth to it. It's not made up stories. It's not fables. It is the truth of God. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Again, that is a promise of the Word of God that I believe is being fulfilled in the days that we're living right now. Sure They're turning their ears away from the truth. I'm not talking about the lost people. I'm not talking about sinners. I'm not talking about the unchurched, whatever name you want to put to it. I'm talking about people that's sitting in a building that claims to be a church. They're turning away their ears from the truth. They're turning it to something else. They're making... The gospel into fairy tales. They're, they're playing church, but they're denying the power of God. They're going against the Word. They're compromising. They're, they're taking away the Trinity and the divinity of God, and they're placing Jesus into this category of He was just another man. He was a prophet like all the others. Well, He was God in the flesh. He filled a prophet role but he also filled the role of God in the flesh. There was, we mentioned in, I give the, the class a trick question this morning. It's like, how many Jesuses was there? One. No, Jesus was a common name. Jesus Christ was one. You know, sneaky, sneaky. But we've got to consider these things. People take these little things and they twist it and they just build on it. And if they can look, make it look good and feel good, people will follow it. You confront people with their sin and they don't like it. And they'll go the other way. Yes, yes. Verse 5 says, uh, this is instructions to us. Okay, We're supposed to be doing this. Verse 5 says, but watch thou in some things. Is that not what it says? Let me try again. It says, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. I don't want afflictions. You're going to have them. We're Christians. The world hates you. 
Do you know that? The world hates you as Christians. Amen. Hated Jesus first. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Not a partial proof, but full proof. Whenever you leave a conversation with somebody, they should know that you're a Christian. When you leave talking with somebody, when you've had an encounter with somebody, they, if they can't tell there's something different about you from everybody else, you're not living that Christian standard that you're supposed to be living. Amen. Now verse 6, Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Okay? He's getting ready to leave this world. He's not leaving town. He's leaving the world. Okay? Yes. Verse 7 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. When we leave this world, I pray that we all have that testimony right there. Amen. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, as a result of verse 7, because I fought a good fight, because I finished my course, and because I kept the faith, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only. Oh, here comes some good stuff. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. So that sounds like we're going to take part uh, in some crowns of righteousness. If we keep the faith. If we fight a good fight. If we finish our course. And surely we must. We yes. Must. I'm going to stop right there. We're looking at Paul. Okay, He went through some hard times in his life. But he never turned his back on Jesus. Okay, Once he become a Christian, despite the hard times, he never turned his back on Jesus. Amen. So if you want a title for today's message, it's don't stop, just keep going. Don't stop, just keep going. Now I want to read to you. I'm going to cheat because i got a bookmark. So I can get there quick. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse, uh, verse 23, we're going to read some things about Paul. Now, as we're reading this about Paul, keep in mind some things about Jesus, uh, who is our perfect example. Uh, Jesus was somebody who never gave up. Remember what we said? The flesh didn't want to endure what Jesus was going to endure. So he prayed, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, I'm not giving up. You sent me for this purpose, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fulfill it. So Jesus was somebody that he, Jesus was rejected. He was hated. He was mistreated. He was talked about. He was beat. He was tortured. Yes, yes. But he still didn't give up and go back on how he was created. He came into this flesh for a purpose and he fulfilled it. Now Paul. Let's look at Paul. He was a man who, before he was a Christian, a lot of people hated him. After he became a Christian... A lot of people hated him, right? They rejected him. Uh, they mistreated him. Uh, they beat him. They tortured him. They left him. They, they thought they had killed him. They left him for dead. But he just wouldn't die because God had a purpose. Yes. And Paul was fulfilling that purpose. He was living that purpose. He was doing the will of the Father. And as long as we as Christians are doing the will of the Father until, the, until God says, okay, I'm done. Your purpose is fulfilled. If we are truly living the standard that God has placed in our lives and we're working the calling that God has put us in, there's nothing in this Word that can convince me that Satan can take my life until God says, I'm done. Right. Amen. If we're doing the will of the Father, well, so I get to live to be 100 years old? That's not what I'm saying. I'm 42 years old right now. Uh, yes. 
Sorry. Had a moment. I had a moment. I'll be 43 this year. If I make it to be 50 and God says, okay, you have done the things that I have laid on you to do. You have fulfilled your purpose. He may take me at 50. It's when that purpose is fulfilled. Now, if I get out of God's will and I get out here in the flesh and do my own thing, backslide, I'm in dangerous territory. Okay? But as long... Yes, I truly believe if I am doing the, the will of the Father and I'm working in that purpose that He's put on my life, I'm abiding in that calling, the devil can't kill me until God's done with me. Amen. That's my belief. Yes. Now, I think the Apostle Paul fits into that category. So if you're there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, this is Paul talking. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am moot, or I am more. And laborers more abundant. So he's done more work than a lot of these others they're talking about. In stripes above measure. He's been whipped. Remember the scourging we've talked about? Uh, he's been whipped. Not, not a scourging like Jesus had, but he's been whipped more abundantly. He's been whipped more than the others. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently. I've been put in jail for preaching the gospel more than the rest of y'all. In deaths oft. So he's been at death's doorstep. He has been, they've tried to kill him more times than the others that they're talking about. So let's get into the details. Verse 24 says, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. 39 times 5. My brain just stopped. But that's okay. That's a lot. 40 times 5. What's that? 200? Minus 5. So 195. Does that sound right? 195? There's a lot of scars on his body. Where, why did he get those scars? For rebelling against the Jews and preaching the gospel of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. You ain't got to an answer, but think about it. So this, this 195 stripes didn't happen at one time. It was 39 at a time. If you got whipped 39 times, would you give up Jesus? Say, no more, I'm done. And I don't mean just whipped. What happens when these whips hit their backs and their sides and their legs? It cut them. Okay? A lot of pain. Would you give up after 39 of those? What if it happened twice? What if after you've been whipped five different times, would you say, you know, this is enough. I'm, I can't take no more. I'm done. This, this Jesus, Lord, you've been good to me. I appreciate it, but I can't take this no more. Would you give up? Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Rewording that scripture of the religious people who thought they knew better than Paul did, he received 195 stripes. Verse 29 Thrice, three times, was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, and they thought they killed him when they stoned him. They left him there. They thought he was dead. Thrice, three times, I suffered shipwreck. And all the people thought they were dying. That's a whole other message and a story right there. That's a good one. A night and a day, I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. Okay, a lot of traveling. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. His own people was turning against him. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. 
in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So in the midst of all these things trying to kill him, he still had to serve the churches. He still had to take care of the churches. He still had a congregation to care for. He still had preachers that he had to lead and to guide. He still had people to shepherd and teach them the truth of the gospel. He still had people he had to lead while everybody else was trying to kill him. He didn't ride around in a Cadillac while he was doing it either. No. And he walked around as a rich man doing all this. No. No, he didn't. He went hungry many times. Didn't have money for a lot of things. Sometimes the churches and the Christians would help him. Sometimes he was a tent maker by trade. Sometimes he had to get out and do what a lot of preachers do today. They have to work a daily job. After all the stuff that we just read about, can you imagine why anybody would want to give up? In the flesh, yeah. In the flesh, they would give up a long time ago. But in the Spirit, that's a different story. This is where it becomes of the utmost importance that we understand the fight that's going on in each side, every one of us right now. There's a fight between the flesh and the Spirit. One of them is going to be on top. One of them is going to be in control. And the other one is going to have to submit or be in subjection to the other. It is super important that we make sure the spirit is in control. Because when we let that, we put that spirit on the sideline and we get in the flesh, that's when the flesh says, I'm not doing this no more. This hurts. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm beat down. I'm wore down. I'm wore out. The people hate me. They're trying to kill me. I'm done. No more. Lord, find somebody else. That's the worst thing that we can say. When we give up on Jesus, what have we got? Some people like this word because they understand it. Some people don't like this word because they understand it. But the Bible teaches something called apostasy. Apostasy is turning your back on Jesus. Turning your back on God. Turning your back and going the other way. And if we give up and we just, you know, Job's wife said, you know, you're going through all of this stuff. Why don't you just roll over and die? You know, give up, roll over and die. If he had done that, then he would have given up on God. And that's exactly what he would have done. He would have rolled over and died right there. We cannot give up. Amen. We must keep going. We can't stop. Keep going. So when these things get hard, when life is, is challenging us, Remember that Paul, despite what happened, Paul never took his eyes off Jesus. Paul never took his eyes off the Lord. So when things is coming against us, when there's sickness, affliction, the world is against us, our job is against us, uh, you name it, whatever we're facing, call on Jesus. Call on the Lord. Speak it. Rebuke the devil. Okay? Okay? We have that right. We have that authority. Rebuke the devil. You know, we, we have that, that conversation a while ago where we talked about it getting darkest just before daylight. Um, Paul depended on the Lord. And when things got so dark, he still depended on the Lord. When things in our life get that dark, we must depend on the Lord. Amen. Right? Put whatever you're dealing with right now, whatever struggles you're facing, remember what the Word of God says. I can do all things, not just some, all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That means I can and I will be an overcomer. Are are wars and battles that are fought, are they won uh, just by sitting back and saying, 
I'm going to win. I'll win this war. It's mine. No, there's work to be done. There's fighting to be done. There's bloodshed. There's pain. There's heartache. Spiritual warfare and the things that we face each and every day that the, the devil is coming against us with, we have to fight him. Yeah. Okay? First and foremost, the Word says we've got to submit ourselves to God. And then we've got to rebuke the devil. And we have to have an understanding at that point. If we're submitted to God and we rebuke the devil, he'll flee. Amen. He'll leave us. It doesn't say that's optional. It doesn't say if the devil wants to. The devil is afraid of the Word. He can't fight the Word. He can't stand against the Word. we got to use it. Amen. This sword of the Spirit is our weapon. This is how we fight that spiritual warfare. When Paul says, I fought a good fight, he fought it with the Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. we got to use it. we got to stand against the devil. Uh, when we're down... You know, when we're all down in the dumps and we feel the pressures of this life, it's easy to just want to give up. I think, I'm pretty sure I've told this before, as being pastor for five years, there's been a few times I told Misty, if this is the way it is, I'm, I'm ready to quit. Just be done with it. Uh... See if Brother O'Neill will step back up and take over as pastor and just wipe my hands clean. Uh, so yeah, it, it happens to pastors too. But I didn't. I got in my little fleshly moment and once I got out of that fleshly moment and got back to where I needed to be with the Lord, uh, we buckled our seatbelt and pulled it tight and here we go. Uh, and we're going to keep going. Amen? Yeah. You know, the devil, if he gets into you, uh, gets into your life, and he gets into your family in a small church like this one, and I don't mean small in spirit, I mean 30 or 40 of us, right? This is not a thing where I come to church and I look out into the balconies and say, there's a thousand people and I don't know none of your names, but I'm glad you're here. Instead, I look in this congregation get that hamster back in the wheel and most of the time I can I know your name I know where you live I probably have your phone number on my refrigerator or in my cell phone I might have been to your house it's these churches where it's not just a bunch of people but it's these churches where your family they can hurt you the worst and that goes two ways I can hurt you the worst because we're in this family type situation. And the devil loves to play in those areas. So we can't give him the opportunity. We can't give him the chance. I make it a point every Sunday morning when I come in here and I anoint these doorways that I rebuke the devils and I pray that a hedge of protection that no unclean spirit is allowed to pass through that hedge into this building. I pray against the spirits of affliction, the spirits that influence us and... and Cause us to think bad things. I speak against all this stuff because I need us, all of us, me included, when we're here, to be focused on the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is what it's about. It's about Jesus. It's about Him crucified. It's about us sharing the gospel. It's about us learning how to share the gospel. It's about us being reproved and rebuked, myself included. Look, Brother O'Neill, I'm sure, will vouch for this. As a preacher and as a pastor, whenever we're studying, sometimes the, I don't get on my toes, the Spirit gets on my toes. We get corrected as we're studying. Yes. Okay? Word it. it happens. Amen. But we, we all fall into that category as a church of being reproved and rebuked and growing and being encouraged. It's all necessary. So when the devil comes in and he starts trying to cause problems and cause... Uh, brings attacks against you and in your home, stand against it. Amen. I'm not backing down. I'm not giving up. Right. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not. <laughs> oh, that's the hard part. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Because we'll mess it up. Yep. Yep. I'll mess it up. My thoughts will mess it up. I'll try to make it make sense. 
Sometimes it doesn't make sense. You just got to put the craziest stuff we can imagine out there in Jesus' hands and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I need you to do it. You do it. You tell me what to do, and I will follow you. If you lead me right down the banks of hell to preach at the gates of hell, then I'll do it. But I've got to have you there to lead me. That's when it works. If I go on my own, I'll mess it up. Don't give up. Satan is trying to attack. He's trying to cause division. He's trying to cause discord. But the Word of God, Psalms 32 and 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. That's a promise. So if He promised to instruct us and promised to lead us in the ways that we should go, why would we go any other direction? Don't give up. Place your trust in Jesus. Place your trust in God. Place your trust in the Spirit that's inside of us leading us. It's with us all the time. And just go. Amen. Don't, if it don't make sense, don't try to make it make sense. Uh, the revelation of the Word will come when you're ready. Just trust Him and obey. Amen? Amen. 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 Yes. And we have this assurance that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if we live this life as a Christian, we live according to His standard and we let Him lead and us follow, when we leave this world, when we leave this fleshly body behind, according to His promise, we're going to be present with the Lord. Amen? He's got a mansion for us. I love it. This life is temporary. If you live to be 25, 50, 100, 125, 120, it's temporary. That's a long time. It's nothing compared to eternity. Hell is not a place for Christians. Hell was not created for people. You know that? It wasn't even created for people. The Word of God says hell's going to have to enlarge itself because of all the intruders going into it that wasn't even supposed to be there. Not because God sent us there, but because people send themselves there because they refuse and reject Jesus. Amen. All right. Let us stand. Don't give up, folks. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Does anybody want to be prayed with? Father, we come to You today, Lord. I want to thank You for this day. Lord, I want to thank You for Your Word and your, for Your promise and for Your instruction, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you, you bury this up deep in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, that regardless of what comes our way, just hold on to Your hand and never give up. Lord, I know the devil's out there seeking whom he can devour. He's out there trying to kill, steal, and destroy. But Lord, we know You as our, as our Lord and as our Savior, as our Master, as that Spirit dwelling inside of us, Lord, that there is more power inside of us than the devil can ever bring against us. Lord, we know that we're overcomers. So we stand today, Lord, in Your presence, asking for more wisdom and more knowledge and more understanding, Lord, that we can learn how to use that sword of the Spirit, that we can learn how to fight the devil, so that we can learn how to be victorious in all things, Lord. And we thank You for it. Lord, all these prayer requests that was mentioned today, uh, Father, I pray that You reveal Yourself to them in a mighty way. And Lord, I pray for this nation. Lord, help this nation, every, every form of government, you know, from the local level all the way up to the presidency. Father, I pray that You lay conviction on this nation in a mighty way. I pray You lay conviction on America greater than it's ever been since the existence of America. Lord, touch the hearts and minds of everybody. And Lord, I thank You and I pray right now, Father, that everything that we say and everything that we do would be according to Your will and would be pleasing to You, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.